Uh, and now we discuss electrostatic boundary value of problems. Uh, to serve as our introduction, we say now that the procedure for determining the electric field E in the past or in the preceding chapters has generally been to use either the Coulomb's law, the Gauss law, where, okay, we use the Coulomb's law when we are looking at the electric field due to a point charge. So when we have the point charges, we use the Coulomb's law. And when we have the charge distribution, maybe of a surface of a volume or a, or a line, then we find the Gauss uh, law much, uh, much better or much easier to use. Therefore, when we have the known charge distributions, it also found out that uh, if the potential is known, then we can use this expression. We can be able to, uh, to evaluate the electric uh, field strength E from a known potential uh, V. But now we are saying that uh, in most practical situations, however, neither the charge distribution nor the potential is known. And in that, those kind of problems, we, uh, we, we use other methods. And these methods are the ones that we are going to be using. So we are saying we have so, so far covered uh, these three methods, and now sometimes it may not be possible to use either of them, uh, particularly when you are dealing with D life or practical electrostatic problems. And you think that in where we consider the practical electrostatic problems, uh, the electrostatic conditions, or, or rather only the electrostatic conditions such, such as charge and potential, as some boundaries are known. And uh, we, of course, still need to find out how, 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 how the electric field or the potential is uh, developed uh, throughout the entire region. So such problems, as we have said, are tackled using the Poisson's or Laplace equation. So this is, we either use this uh, as option uh, four, four one. We use Poisson. Or two, we use Laplace. Uh, equation and three we use the method of images so these are the three options that we have and we are going to be exploring uh, each one of them uh, in our subsequent chapter and you see that these problems or these uh, practical uh, electrostatic problems are uh, referred to as boundary value problems and we shall also discuss the concept of resistance and capacitance and how we can use Laplace equation uh, to develop each of this, each of these, both the capacitance and the resistance. And we start our discussion with the derivation of the Poisson's and Laplace equation. And we start from the Gauss law. And from the Gauss law, we found out that the divergence of D is equal to law V. And we have also found out that D can be expressed in terms of uh, E with an epsilon. We also found out that we can express E as a negative gradient of the potential V. So having said that, if we take this E and we plug it at that point, we are going to have a gradient of epsilon. Of course, you, we want now to, to replace E with this. Therefore, we are going to have a negative coming there and then gradient of V. So we have replaced this term. Therefore, on the right hand side, we still keep our raw V. And that takes us to equation 6.3. And we say that equation 6.3 can now be simplified further. First and foremost, we, we state that this is for an inhomogeneous medium. And if we consider the medium to, to, be, to be homogeneous, then E, our epsilon, is going to be constant over the entire medium. And for that reason, then we can divide it, we can divide both sides, we can 
multiplied both sides with negative epsilon and negative epsilon and we have equation 64 and the equation 64 now 64 and 63 are the two equations that define are called the poisons uh, equation Poisson's equation uh, and we have already stated that uh, the Poisson's equation in I should uh, clean up this uh, the Poisson's equation in 63 is for an homogeneous medium the one where epsilon is not a uh, constant and the other one at 64 is for a homogeneous medium for where the medium retains the same value of epsilon therefore that is how we derive and define the Poisson's equation and therefore we have a special case when rho rho v is equal to zero that is the divergence of a media uh, from a medium uh, gives you that there is no charge no charge in the in the in the, in the region or, or there is no free charge uh, in the in the region. We normally when talking about a volume, talk about divergence from this volume. And we see that uh, if there is some rho v and cross that you apply some electric flux uh, or, or you apply some electric field, therefore the flux that is going through the region is equivalent to the charge that is encrossed therein. And therefore, if there is no charge in the cross there, the flux will pass, bypass um, our volume. So in that case, therefore, if our volume has no free, has no free charge, therefore our equation 6-4 will just translate to 6-5, where we quit the right-hand side with zero because we have said it's a free, uh, free charge-free region. And then we equate this equation, or we call this equation uh, the Laplace equation. They are very simple equations. They are very closely related. Laplace associates or said or said that it is possible for a volume not to have any free charge. And therefore, he just give us a possibility of a zero, and therefore we ended up with the Laplace equation. And therefore, the person who did the donkey work of showing us this is the poison and uh, he defines two equations one for homogeneous medium and the other one for inhomogeneous medium six three and six four respectively and just as a, as a reminder i should mention that uh, the we, we said uh, this equation comes to to this one and this was divergent divergence of the negative gradient of v and it translates to become nabla or nabla squared and we said that is how we define nabla in our section uh, i guess 6.5 no 3.5 or oh, here 3.8 and uh, this is you call this one nabla uh, we also call it delta so you might have delta squared or nabla squared as the names of your term so but uh this is a very uh, uh, unique expression which now we can uh, define in both Cartesian, cylindrical, and spherical coordinate systems. And if you recall uh, how we define each of them from uh, the, uh, the mentioned section 3.8, uh, for the Cartesian is quite straightforward because it is twice partial derivative of uh, x, y, and z. And therefore, since V is a scalar, then it is still uh, remains uh, as such. And therefore, this is how you 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 define Laplace equation. And therefore, if you are also to define the Poisson's equation in the three uh, coordinate systems, you would only introduce the negative rho V over epsilon on the right hand side. And therefore, it still becomes uh, follows the same idea. So for the Laplace. In the Cartesian, uh, in the theoretical coordinate system, we just introduced the terms that we, we, we described earlier, as you can see, equation 6, 7, and 6, 8. And you see now that Laplace equation is of primary importance in solving electrostatic problems.
or problems that involve a set of conductors maintained at different potentials. And examples of such problems include capacitors and vacuum tube diodes. And we also state that uh, the Laplace and Poisson's equations are very useful in solving electrostatic field problems, as well as uh, in other field problems like uh, in other fields. And one of the applications of these two equations that we shall find is in uh, expressing the potential in, uh, in magnetic or magnetostatics and we are going to express it as a magnetic potential. And we will see that uh, the magnetic potential would not be useful or, or mean anything unless it is to mean something in Laplace and Poisson's equations. And therefore, in the other fields beyond uh, our electrical engineering, you can spread them in heat, representing temperature, stress in, in, in representing uh, fluid flow, and pressure when you are discussing about the seepage. So we will not go through that, but I can I can guarantee you that in magnetostatics, which we shall cover in electromagnetics too, we are going to fight uh, the application of the Laplace equation in defining of magnetic potential. And now we shift our attention to another theorem called the uniqueness theorem. And we see now that since there are several methods, both analytical, graphical, numerical, experimental, of solving a given problem, we wonder whether solving the Laplace equation in different ways gives different solutions. And therefore, we begin to solve, uh, and before we begin to solve the Laplace equation, we should answer this question. If a solution of Laplace equation satisfies a given set of boundary conditions, is it the only possible solution? And the answer to that is a yes. That if there is only, or rather, if the solution we, we get satisfies the conditions that we, uh, we set, then we say that there cannot be any other solution except that one solution that we have found. And therefore, the solution is said to be unique. And therefore, does any solution of Laplace equation that satisfies the same boundary condition must be the only solution regardless of the method used? So you can use whether analytical, graphical, experimental, or numerical methods. And if we say that the solution is unique as long as uh, the the is a, the problem or or rather the solution satisfies the same boundary conditions that is the definition of uniqueness theorem and this theorem applies to any solution of poisons or Laplace equation in any given region or cross service and therefore the theorem is proved by contradiction we would want to find out well, is it possible that we find one solution V1 and another solution V2 that are not the same? So by contradiction, we would uh, uh, set uh, the V1 and V2 to be to be the uh, twice rate differential uh, solutions that is defined by Laplace and Poisson. And we give them, we give them the same uh, boundary conditions, such that equation six six nine is the definition of uh, uh, Laplace equation for solution one and solution two respectively. Then we say that on the boundary, this is the condition that we are setting of the boundary condition that v one and v two are the same. Then we consider the difference because we are solving, we are proving this uh, uh, by contradiction.
And therefore, if this be the case, then there are solutions, or rather this, uh, the differential equations would still obey this difference. So if you were to apply uh, the nabla squared on either, because we say that these equations are uh, sat satisfies the Laplace equation, and the Laplace equation satisfies uh, uh, the lap Of course, uh, any of the solutions v1, v2 would, supply, would satisfy the Laplace equation that says that uh, if the solution is v, then the Nabla squared would be equal to zero. And for that reason, if we if they are different, then the difference between them would be would still satisfy this uh, this uh, condition or this equation of the Laplace. For that reason, that is how we define equation 610. And therefore, now extending this equation uh, follows uh, this idea. But we are saying that at the boundary, the boundary condition that we have set for ourselves, this means that the VD must be, must be zero because we have said they are, they are equal. So we have this. Uh, remember that we have the differential equation or we have uh, two uh, values that are said to satisfy the Laplace equations v1 and v2 and they are given at a condition v1 is equal to v2. And therefore you apply the Laplace equation at section uh, 610 and 611 or equation 610 and 611 and then we still make sure that the solution satisfy the boundary condition that we set for ourselves which is 611b. Now according to what we have found before with the divergence theorem we know that divergence, or rather, you know, this is normally on the right hand side, on the left hand side. We normally say that cross service integral of a vector A can always be obtained by finding the divergence integrated over the volume, as we can see in equation, equation 612. In this case, we are saying that service is the service surrounding. A service S is the service surrounding the volume V and is the boundary of the original problem. So if we let A to be a vector that is defined by the gradient of the difference uh, VD, we can use a vector identity that we know so well because we say that any vector that satisfies this uh, condition is that must always give us a zero. Uh, before we say that, that this is equal to zero, I should uh, specify myself because uh, we are setting our vector to be generated by the gradient. If you remember, we said that a vector or a gradient of a vector, sorry, a gradient of a scalar always gives us a vector. And that is how we are, we, we are obtaining it. So we are just setting ourselves that uh, our vector VD is uh, generated by by the gradient of a scalar that that we multiply by the same scalar to find our vector a v a. So I will uh, rectify myself there and say that we know v d from the boundary condition that is equal to zero according to this equation. And therefore, this equation will bring this term to zero. Then we are left with equation 613 that says that the divergence of A is equal to the gradient of VB dot gradient of VD. Just because we have just picked uh, that term. And this is a, a vector identity that we just needed to, uh, to, to remember that can be provided. So if we say that to be the case, we can substitute this equation in here 
such that we replace our gradient, our divergence of A with this term to have equation 614. And since we know VD at the boundary to be equal to zero, therefore the cross surface integral of the VD or the gradient of VD will actually vanish, it will actually become zero. And therefore, we are left only with the left hand side. And if you look at this, this is equivalent to when you dot this product, uh, they, these two products, this will be equivalent to uh, magnitude of this. This is going to give us a scalar, and this is going to give us a scalar. Or rather, this is going to give us a vector, and this is going to give us a vector. Therefore, when you dot the vector, you are going to find that this would be. To be the scalar squared and therefore it is integrated over the volume dv so that is what gives us the next equation and since we have seen the right that the right hand side goes to zero therefore this becomes our new uh, integration or the integ and since and since uh, we can we, we can say that the integrate is if it were positive because when you square anything, it will never go to negative. Therefore, we can say that uh, this, this term is the one that is going to give us b equals to zero. Because if there were some terms that were, were going to the negative, then the whole integral would, would, would have a possibility of being equals to zero. But since everything is positive, then uh, from mathematics, we can definitely say that it is this uh, magnitude itself that is equals to zero. And for that reason, we actually go back to where we started and say that the difference is actually zero. And therefore, v, uh, v2 and v1 must be equal. And that is how we have said that vd will always be zero everywhere in v, and therefore v1 and v2 will always be equal. And therefore, we have seen that solution that obeys the boundary condition that we set for ourselves always is unique. And therefore, this leads us to the uniqueness problem that says that if a solution to a Laplace equation can be found that satisfies the boundary conditions, then that solution is unique. And uh, similarly, we want to say some uh, we can do the same thing for the Poisson's equation. That if we find a solution to the Poisson's equation that satisfies that satisfy the boundary conditions, then that uh, that solution will always be unique. And everywhere in the region where the uh, the the differential equation is defined. Now, before we begin to solve the boundary value problems. We should bear in mind that three, there are three things that uniquely describe a problem. That first, it must the problem must be defined by the appropriate differential equation, either a plus or poison. And number two, the solution of the region must always be defined. And number three, you must always have the boundary conditions properly defined. And if that be the case, then you have you're going to have a unique solution to the problem. And a problem does not have a unique solution and it cannot be solved completely if any of these conditions here are, are missing. And now on to the general procedure for solving Poisson's or Laplace equation. And we say that uh, the following general procedure may be taken in solving a given boundary value problem that involves either Laplace or Poisson's equation. The first step is always to solve the, the differential equation given. So either you might be given uh, the Laplace equation if, okay, you might consider that to use the Laplace if you know the charge is free 
or there is no free charge in the boundary value problem or you may use the Poisson equation if uh, you know for sure that at the boundary the service charge density or the volume charge density law V is not equal to zero. And you might use the direct integration when the one function where V is a function of uh, one variable or you may use the idea or the method of separation of variables if V has more than one variable. Therefore, at this point, the solution that you get is not going to be unique. It's not going to be unique, but it's going to be expressed in terms of a known integration constant. So you're going to be having a known integration constant, which you must, be, uh, you, must, you must determine in the next step. Therefore, it is at the next step where you have the boundary conditions are defined that you're going to apply them to their known integration constants and therefore you are going to obtain a unique solution of V. So what this uh, step allows us is to, uh, the first and second step allows us to get the potential V. Therefore it is from when we obtain V, we can be able to apply the known equations for E to be the negative gradient of V, D to be the value or uh, a function of E in epsilon naught, and j from the function of uh, electric field strength E and the sigma or, or conductivity of the medium. In the event that you are required to find the induced charge on a conductor, then you may apply this equation where ROS is the service charge density on the interface. Uh, normal to the conductor and it's going to be given by the normal component of electric flux density normal to the conductor. Again, if you are you required to find the capacitors between the two conductors, you can apply uh, this equation or if you find, don't want to find the resistance of an object, you can, you can apply uh, this equation. So we are saying that uh, solving a plus equation may not be as complicated as it may seem and uh, in some cases you can just uh, find the solution by a mere inspection of the problem. So we can also check the solution by going backward and finding if it satisfies both the Laplace or Poisson's equation and the prescribed uh, boundary conditions. 